Hello friends, welcome to Pro Tools Answers, where three certified Pro Tools experts discuss, demonstrate and elaborate on your Pro Tools questions put to the community in the official Avid Facebook support forum. Believe it or not, on Facebook. I'm your host, Dave Phillips, audio engineer and lecturer based in the UK, where the sun is literally trying to kill us. Uh, and on the show today, we are going to be kicking off a beginner's series uh, where we're going to start with looking in depth at the playback engine. And with me as ever is the insanely overqualified Mr. Anders Motz from Tonkraftwerk in Austria. Hello. And a musician engineer who plays baby tuba so good that you either won't believe it was played by a mortal man or <laughs> you'll think it was performed by some mythical deity. Please welcome from Tokyo Mr. Andy Hagerman. How's it going? <laughs> so, playback engine. Now, I I, we say that it's a beginner series, um, but, you know, but Playback Engine is something that even eludes the most experienced users, right? Yeah. You know, I, I do courses all the time, and you know, the Playback Engine is usually in the, the first few because it's so critical to how your system works. And it's amazing how many people with years and years and years of experience, if you ask them, what does this do? They're like, I'm not actually sure. So mm -hmm. this is, whether or not you're a beginner or not, this might be a good, relatively deep dive. Yeah, so we're going to start all the way at the beginning. Um, let me do something unexpected. Oh, you're sharing your screen, Dave. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. Yeah. For those of you who haven't seen our other shows, uh, it's a, a common thing that Dave forgets to share his screen with us when we're recording this. And we're sitting there <laughs> and just looking at his face when explaining uh, stuff. So thank you, Dave. And <laughs> if you haven't seen the other episodes, go back and watch them. They're great. <laughs> but first, look at this. <laughs> but first, look at this. So we, uh, one of the things that I suggest that that uh, users do on on my courses, even with the uh, if, with the degree guys when they're when they're loading up Pro Tools, and I don't know whether this is the same for you guys, but always suggest heading up to before you do anything, you load up Pro Tools, head up to setup, and go to Playback Engine, and just check to see what's going on inside the Playback Engine. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that always catches me out, and I'm somebody who bounces from Playback Engine to Playback Engine constantly, because I'll, I'll use my personas in the studio i'll use two types of live desk um every so often i'll be using black hole uh for routing like we do now um i've got some zoom routing stuff set up with aggregate um and i'll be mixing off of the built-in sound card as well so when i boot up pro tools it's almost a bit of a toss up as to which playback engine is going to be loaded. And the playback engine essentially is your interface. That's probably the simplest way to think about it. It's the the uh, the device that Pro Tools will be picking up all of the inputs, all of the outputs from. It's where the routing happens and it's what Pro Tools uses for playback and recording. And sometimes Pro Tools will just make an arbitrary decision as to which one of these it's going to select. And it can be a little bit of a pain. You know, you'll load up, you don't think about it, you start a session, you hit play, and you don't hear anything whatsoever. And it could be because it's selected something like a, a, a TV that you've, a, an HDMI TV that you've got connected. Or it could be Black Hole, which has got no physical outputs whatsoever. Or if you're still using Soundflower, um, it could be something like that. And it could, it could throw you. You know, you just hit play, you expect stuff to come back and you don't get anything. Um, so one of the first things to do is just head into Playback Engine drop down the thing and select the specific interface that you're going to be using. Now, for, for the newer users, um, and for those of you who are, uh, are looking at new interfaces to buy, there's a kind of key criteria, isn't there, guys, that you need to look for with your interfaces, and that is that they are either Core Audio um, or ASIO compatible. Or HDX or HDX native. Well, I'm, I'm speaking from the native on the native yes. community, yes. Yep. No, you're 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 100 right, 0 percent wrong. One of the things that that can often happen too. By the way, whatever what Dave says is 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 really really good advice. Um, but sometimes you'll get into a situation where, especially if you're in a system where people are connecting and disconnecting different devices, where you'll launch Pro Tools and you'll get a message saying, "Can't find audio hardware," or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And there's a button that says, "Okay." 
and it closes. <laughs> <laughs> and then you launch Puntos again, and it says, audio hardware not found. Okay. And there's no real way to get out of it, or so it seems. There's a great shortcut that will, will help you if you get into a situation where that device that you used before is somehow not available and Pro Tools is confused about what to do, hold the N key, the N for negotiable. Um, hold the N key while you launch Pro Tools and what will happen is Pro Tools will go through its entire launch process and then stop at the point where it needs to cha uh, to, to choose a mm -hmm. playback device. And what you'll see is the window that Dave is showing you right now. And then you could choose a device that you do have. So yes, m checking to make sure that this is all great when you launch Pro Tools is, is, is good, solid practice. Sometimes though, you, you don't even get that far. And w when that happens, again, mm -hmm. hold the N key while you're launching Pro Tools and it'll, it'll give you that window. Yeah, indeed. So if I just select Studio 1810 right there, so that's selecting my Personas 1810 as the playback engine, uh, we'll click OK, and that informs whatever your I.O. setup is going to be. And actually, let me just roll back for a second uh, here, because one of the things that I see quite often on the forums is that people will say they can't see their their selected playback engine or it's grayed out or something like that when they're when they're trying to select a playback engine um, and it's likely because it's not a core audio compatible system pro tools can't see it and when you deep when you kind of uh, dive down into what these guys are using it turns out to be something like USB gaming headphones they're trying to get root pro tools to do the routing for and and pro tools just doesn't see that kind of thing so gaming headphones generally don't work um, and it's the same with some USB mixers as well you know like the, the USB two channel mixers where you can just record a, a, a two channel thing into Pro Tools um, sometimes they don't pick up I just need to hide my controls again there we go so playback engine will inform what inputs you see and what outputs you see as well. So if I go and select black hole and hope that nothing happens to my audio, we'll head up to playback here, uh, head up to IO again, and suddenly, because I've selected two uh, black hole two channel, we can only see two channels of in and two channels of out. And uh, another common complaint that we'll see is that people will load up a, a session and it will show a, an it's not an error message it's a it's a notification that says that some inputs and outputs aren't available mm -hmm. and it's because the playback engine that was used with that original ses uh, session or and some of the routing that came with it just isn't available in the particular playback engine that's been selected hence why it shows up an error just to say these paths are no longer uh, valid with this particular playback engine uh, you've got selected. So you need to go to, and do a little bit of work in, in playback engine or IO setup to just reconstitute everything uh, and make sure that everything's in the right place. You know, another thing I like about the way you're working this is you're doing this with no session open. Um, one of the things that if you have a session that's open and you start changing playback engines, you're going it'll close your session, it'll save your session, do a whole bunch of other things. So mm -hmm. this is a, a good kind of a discipline to get into is to, to get all that squared away before a session's launched. You don't have to do it that way, but but what the flexibility that Dave has mm. and the speed at which he's changing things is because there's no session open that would have to close and reopen. Mm. If I might add here, uh, since we're doing a, a beginner's s series here, uh, what are possible error or, or possible ways that you can screw this up. Uh, I would start off by just making sure if you're using an USB interface, make sure it's connected directly to a computer, not through a USB hub or something, because you really want a speedy connection to your interface. Mm -hmm. So the USB cable goes directly into the computer, not through an, a USB hub or some other device that has a USB. Um, yeah, that'll throw up the, uh, the, the CPU errors. <clears throat> yeah, and another thing that might be a problem that you might not have thought about is that some USB cables are for charging only. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're, if, 
if your computer can't find your, your USB interface, make sure that your USB cable is actually capable of transmitting data back and forth. So that has been a, a source of errors for, for students of mine. So that's one thing that I always make them check if, if there's something wrong. And also, if you have a, an interface that actually has an on or on off button that's usually reserved for interfaces that have a power adapter or a power cable, not the USB mm -hmm. interface. Make sure that your that your interface is booted up before you start your computer. And what I mean is actually when you when you before you switch on your computer, switch on the interface and let it be there for 10 or 15 seconds mm -hmm. and some of them all also do a little clicky thingy when they are initialized and ready and only if you do that before you launch your computer the computer will be able to make a solid connection to that device and that's also a, a source of, of errors um, I've had a lot of clients that that switch on everything at at the same time with one power switch basically mm -hmm. And when you boot up the computer before the interface in, is initialized, it might find it and you can select it as a playback engine, but it will crash all of the time because it hasn't been initialized properly. Mm. So make sure it's initialized before you start the computer. And as an aside, not related to the playback engine, but if you're gonna do what Anders is, is recommending, which you should, make sure that your speakers connected to that <laughs> interface are not turned on because that click click, the little relays inside your interface that are clicking will cause a, a, a voltage spike going out to the speakers and that can cause pops and, and eventual damage to the speakers and just an annoying, terrible sound. Yeah. Indeed, the, okay, la Dave. the, the last thing that I wanna mention is just the sample rates. Because again, mm -hmm. every so often a, a sample rate error will be thrown up to say that Pro Tools can't load the session with the specific sample rate and it's because mm. it could be because the the playback engine isn't connected to the thing that you think it is connected to uh, mm -hmm. i used to get this a lot with an hdmi tv that i had connected that it just won't do anything above 44.1 every so often it will even say i can't load a session at 44.1 and everything should be able to load at 44.1 um, but it just kind of goes back to you can limit the amount of uh, friction you have getting into your session by just checking playback engine before you head into a into any kind of session you can save a lot yeah. of headaches i feel when Indeed. when we're talking about sample rates should we uh, maybe show our viewers how to change the the default sample rate of your system should i should i do that awesome okay so uh in pro tools i go to setup hardware and in the setup hardware uh, window, th this might look very different on your computer, depending on what hardware you have connected. I have the Matrix Studio right here. So mm -hmm. there is not much that I can do because everything is done in this dadman software that, that you can see in the background here. But what we have here is uh, uh, usually, <laughs> I don't have it, but uh, uh, oh yes, there is there. Uh, sample rate, uh, it says- um, It's right there, man. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, you have something called sample rate and mine is set to 48k because I usually uh, do a lot of film work and that's my default sample rate. And this, whatever you set here, you can only do when there's no session open. Uh, so if I set 48 kilohertz and when I start a new session, file, create new or command N or, or control N on a PC, uh, you get this uh, dashboard where I create a new session. It says here, sample rate 48 kilohertz. So this makes me, uh, I, I don't have to fight the system anymore. If this always says 44.1 mm. and and you, all of your sessions that you create, you wanna have them in 48, it's showing what you've made as a default sample rate. So. Uh, so in my case, it says 48 kilohertz. I don't need to change that every time I launch. That doesn't mean you. That doesn't mean that you can't though, right? So you can, still you can, can change yeah. your sample rate. I mean, what what he's done in the in the hardware setup window is to set what you'll see as a default in this 
dashboard window. It doesn't limit you in any other way, right? You yeah. can still create, yeah. uh, you know, you can still create a session at 44.1 or 96 or whatever you want to do. It's just a, he's now set a default yeah. for when a new session is created, just removing one one more small bump in the road on the way to creating a session. Yeah, It's also worth mentioning that a lot of people don't quite get what they, the hardware setup box is for. Uh, it's it's reserved for Avid interfaces, isn't it? It does none of the third party stuff shows up there. It's just Avid based stuff. Well, it will give you shortcuts to the the hardware mm. interfaces for anything, right? Mm. So, um, but yes, you're you're right that the hardware setup window, which is not what this episode's about, <laughs> um, the hardware setup window will will show you details of the Avid interfaces because you know because the you know, it's it's an avid window, mm. but if you if it's not an avid interface, then what you'll see is a is a one button that will take you to the driver for mm -hmm. that other interface. Yeah, mm. and, and it's still it's still the gateway. And and focus focus right uses mixed control. That's the front end for the focus right stuff. Um, for sure. And it uses universal control, which is the front end for that. And it's exactly the same thing as what hardware uh, setup is doing. It's just mm -hmm. that we have third party stuff will have an external app. To do it in. and you can get to it by the way from the hardware setup window mm. in most cases so mm. great so what's uh, what's the next thing that we should uh, check um andy anders can you the right down from the mm -hmm. from the top from the audio device is if you're using an hdx system um is where you can choose whether or not you're going to be using the new hybrid engine um, and that this is unique. If you're not using a native system, you won't see this, obviously. But if you are, then then you have the ability to uh, to choose whether or not you're going to use the classic HDX engine or whether you're going to use the the hard uh, the the hybrid engine, which is what Anders has got. And the reason why this is worth mentioning is that there's there's been a lot of people who are, and I and I found this surprising, a lot of people who are kind of not huge fans of the hybrid engine because they they want to be able to use uh dsp and native plugins you know together in windows um it's not i i don't find that a problem at all but um but you know that's a place where you can turn on and off whether or not you're going to be use using the new hdx hybrid engine or the more traditional hdx engine mm -hmm. great um so what's the next thing to check here? It so the next thing is, go ahead. Hardware buffer, Andy. Hardware buffer. Um, I'd like to take this one in if I could. Yeah, go ahead. Um, let me. Do you want to share your screen or should I? Sure, let me share my screen. All the pros share their screens. All the, all the pros share <laughs> you, you kidding me? All right, so let me <laughs> drag this button over there. All right, and um, close this out. All right, you guys are seeing my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so um, so the hardware buffer is one of those things that that people will understand partially, but very often they will not understand completely. Mm -hmm. Here's here's one of the rules. Rule number one: the hardware buffer affects things that are both real time and native. So so things like um, native AAX plugins, those are going to be affected by the hardware buffer. The bigger your buffer, the more plugins you're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, recording latency is also something that on a native system is real time and, uh, and native, like all things on, on the system. So you know, for la recording latency, you want to set it as small as possible. Um, because that'll, you know, the buffer, a small buffer will give you low recording latency. Um, things like, um, you know, converting files or audio suite, those aren't real time. So the hardware buffer doesn't affect them one way or the other. And of course, if you're on an HDX system, you know, any of your DSP plugins are not affected by the hardware buffer. Now, here's the thing, and here's the part where, where this dive is gonna go a little bit deeper than, than your typical tutorials, is most folks will tell you, um, when you're mixing, set your buffer to be as big as you possibly can make it so that you can have a lot of plugins. But when you're recording, set it to be as small as you possibly can so that you have low recording latency. That was true at one time, but it is no longer the case because now, very secretly and without much fanfare, there are now two, and there have been since Pro Tools 11, two hardware buffers, okay? One that you can see and one that you can't. 
Okay, so I've got a session here, um, and it's a simple session. I've got, uh, let's see, I've got 128 tracks here, 128 audio tracks, um, plus uh, another instrument track, a couple other things in here. Um, and I've loaded it up decently with uh, a number of plugins, about four plugins on each of the audio tracks, just to give you an example. There's no audio really playing back on this, it's just for an example. Now, what I'm here to show you is that there are not one, but there are two hardware buffers. So I'm going to go up here to my window menu and I'm going to show my system usage window. And you can see over here, that's my system usage right now, hovering around, I don't know, 29, 30%. All right. Next thing I'm going to do is go to my playback engine window. Now, if you take a look over here, I've got a hardware buffer size of 32 samples. Now, 32 samples, very small, right? Um, can I record with 32 samples without a problem? Yeah, probably, right? That's not that's not a huge issue. That it certainly is a workable situation, right? Um, but 32 samples also means that I'm not going to get a lot of plugins in my session, or it would if there was only one hardware buffer. So right now, 32 samples is a part of my low latency buffer. This buffer that you see here is the low latency buffer and it applies to only tracks that have a live input, okay? Of which almost none of these tracks do, right? There's only one track right now that actually has a live input and that is the instrument track. So instrument tracks and aux tracks, they have a live input. The other thing that has a live input is any audio track that is a track input enabled or record armed, right? But none of these tracks are. So all of these 130 audio tracks are not living in this 32 sample world. They are living in a different world. They're living in what's called the high latency buffer. The high latency buffer is not visible in my session and I can't change it. It is always set to the highest value that the sample rate supports. So for example, this is a, uh, a 48 or 44.1K session. And so the highest buffer that I can have is 1024 samples. And that's what that invisible buffer is always set to, right? So the invisible buffer is always set to 1024 and it applies to tracks that are playback only, which all of these tracks are. So, okay, with that in mind, let's take a look. I'm gonna close this out and here's my system usage window. And you'll see here that none of my tracks are record armed. And so they are taking up about 30% of the high latency buffer, which is 1024 samples. Now I've got these all grouped together and I've grouped the record arms. So I'm going to record arm all of these audio tracks and watch what happens. Boom. Immediately my CPU load changes drastically. Why? Because all of these tracks have moved from the very large but invisible 1024 sample buffer to a relatively small 32 sample buffer. And that's changed the way that my CPU is going to take a look at tasks, right? Now, that means that all of these tracks that I'm recording with have 32 samples of latency, but it also means I'm playing a game here, right? I'm, I'm at the ragged edge of, of, a, of a CPU overload, right? So, but that's with 130 tracks. Now let's take a look at this. I'm gonna take these, boom, out of record, and they all jump back and everything's safe, everything's happy. Now, I'm gonna ungroup these. Let's say that I want to record on just these five tracks. Okay, let's find out. So we'll record on all these guys, boom. And you can barely see it's changed at all. Why? Because all of the tracks, except for these five, are living comfortably in the high latency domain, right? And we're in no danger of, of, of overloading the CPU or having any kind of crash. Those five tracks that are record armed are living in a different hardware buffer. They're living in the 32 sample low latency domain. So what that means is if I play my cards right and if I understand how this feature works, I can have a lot of plugins in my session and I can have low latency recording on a native system at the same time. Yeah. 
Okay, great, yeah. great stuff, Andy. Uh, thanks for explaining that. And uh, as as you said in the beginning, uh, the playback engine is a constant source of confusion, f even for a lot of professionals. And I think this was a perfect explanation of that. Finally, thank you. You bet. Uh, so where are we going to next? Well, what's down from that? Let's see. The next thing is we're in. Am I errors. am I sharing my screen? By the way. Yes, you are. Yes, you okay, are. great. You might as well keep it on. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Yep. Okay. Okay. So the next thing that you might want to check in your playback engine is the video engine. On my screen, it says enable because I work with video constantly. But if you're never working with video, you should definitely turn the video engine off uh, and only have it on whenever you're using it because mm -hmm it eats up a lot of memory and resources on your computer. So just turning this maybe on here uh, might consume four to six or eight gigabytes of RAM. So only turn it on when you're working with video. That's right. The next one down, I got a beef with. Um, mm -hmm. Ignore errors during <laughs> playback and record. The historical background to this is that back in Pro Tools, prior to Pro Tools 11, um, it was a 32-bit application. Uh, it, it couldn't use the majority of a modern system's resources. And every once in a while, it would just fall over. You know, it, it just couldn't keep up with the demands of, of playback. And, and so what we did is we put in this ignore errors during playback and record. If you click this box, then are you likely to, to hear clicks and pops? Yes, but at least you're not going to you know get the message saying your hard drive is your CPU is too slow and can't keep up with playback. Uh, that box still exists, but I don't think I've clicked it since I've gone to a 64-bit application. Um, and I've, I haven't needed to. Um, just be aware that when you ignore errors during playback and record, it doesn't mean the errors aren't happening, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. It just means that you are not being you know bothered with them. Um, and in most places, you want to you know in most situations, you want to make sure that you're really avoiding any clicks and pops when you're recording or when you're playing back, and certainly when you're bouncing. Um, so my default state is with that box unchecked. Yeah, uh, you're totally right, Andy. The way that I use it, uh, if I'm recording something that's really important that Pro Tools doesn't stop in the middle of a recording, that might mm -hmm. be a live concert that I can't stop, or maybe I'm doing playbacks for a TV show or something like that, and under no circumstances I want Pro Tools to halt to tell me that my drive is too slow. The better alternative for me is that it makes a slight uh, click or pop uh, but powers it through. So that's the only time that I turn yeah. this function on. But yep. is it a lot? Usually, even if I'm doing a very, very important job, I, my system is so stable, so I usually don't need to touch it. But if there's something that my, is slightly off for safety reasons, I might turn this uh, on. But it's very, very rarely. The, the way that I, I look at this button is that Pro Tools always wants to do the playback and the recording and basically any kind of audio tasks with kind of some kind of OCD perfection, right? So if the if the, the demands on the system are getting so much that the, the CPU knows it can't handle it, it will throw up one of those errors, CPU or hardware buffer errors. Mm -hmm. And that's why we'll, we'll, we may see them fairly regularly because we're pushing the computer so hard um, that at some point, the computer is just going to go, I can't do what you're asking me to do it. So I'm going to throw this error up and ask you to make some changes. Um, but this is the button, as you say, that will allow you to allow Pro Tools to ignore that. And it will compromise its quality for the uh, for the purposes of, say, stability or consistency. But mm -hmm. as you say, you do get those those little audible pops. And something that Anders brought up a few uh, a few episodes ago, we were talking about using Pro Tools in a live scenario. Is as you just said, you know, when, you, when you're playing for for TV and you don't want any of anything to stop Pro Tools playing back. When we were talking about running backing tracks through mixers, having that turned on, and I've never turned this box on because I know that once I'll turn it on, I'll forget to turn it on. <laughs> Right. because because that's that's me right, right. um but 
so I've I've just ignored this box and I've always suggested to every student I've ever had never touch this because you'll forget your your bounce you'll have clicks you'll have pops you you won't know that there are errors going on or you won't know that that the computer is struggling because you're telling Pro Tools to ignore it um, but that one scenario that Anders mentioned when you're doing stuff live and you absolutely need to make sure that no fails happen whatsoever that's probably the only situation where i would consider using that yeah yes. totally in all in all other situations clicking that box downgrades pro tools mm -hmm. to just tools yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah and, and, and as as both of you said uh, or mentioned is usually you want to be notified when pro tools has sure. difficulty performing a task and usually it's not Pro Tools fault. There might be some other application in the background, a conflict or something that it warns about. Maybe your hard drive is too, too slow. Uh, and it's usually something that you yourself need to take care of. And maybe it's just a matter of increasing the hardware buffer size or something like that. that that's, a really great, that's a really great point because it's all errors, isn't it? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Now, interesting that you mentioned that because that goes to another relatively new member of the playback engine window at the bottom, mm -hmm. limit number of real-time threads, which one of the things that Pro Tools does is it is it prioritizes the threads that it uses when communicating with the CPU. Now that can cause conflicts with other applications. So if you have stability problems with streaming, for example, uh, audio from one application to another, or, or, or in general, you're getting some stability problems in, in, in a real-time sense, then limiting the number of real-time threads might keep you from, from getting those kinds of errors. So they, they both, I think, address the system in, in two different ways. Ignore errors means I'm okay with clicks and pops. Um, perhaps um, a better way might be to limit the amount of real-time threads, allowing Pro Tools to share the resources a little bit more equitably with other players on your system. Yeah, yeah. this was this was a really smart inclusion, I thought, because it's it's almost like Avid realizing that we're doing a lot more with single systems these days and sure. the, the constant complaints about hardware buffer errors cpu buffer errors this seems to be an attempt to try and get pro tools to play a little bit nicer with everything else uh, in its playground but, sure uh, now you want you want pro tools to be able to be able to be greedy with resources because that's how you're going to get the most powerful system right so that's um, why that's why we have the pro in the tools <laughs> exactly right <laughs> but uh, so i would say that this um I would, and, and I've spoken with my colleagues about this, uh, limiting the number is what you do if you run into a problem. It's not something you would, generally speaking, do um, to prevent a problem, right? It's, it, you are going to be, I think, downgrading the, um, the, the horsepower of your system somewhat um, by clicking that box. You're just going to be avoiding a different problem. So only if, you, only if a problem arises in terms of, of streaming um, should you think about... Uh, clicking that box but i'll be honest with you i'll i'll click the limiting number of real-time threads a lot quicker than i'll ignore errors during playback and record <laughs> is this yeah. is this uh, a... andy can i can i just add one more thing here about this sure. uh, this is you you mentioned here uh, protos throwing an error or you have a, a, a problem and what those problems could be uh, we made a list and a great episode about problem solving for Pro Tools, how to mm -hmm. set up your system per, for performance and stability. And if you are if you are experiencing problems that are coming back and forth, you should check out that episode. Even though it's a long one, maybe an hour, it's time well invested because it will help you solve most, 99% of all problems that pro people have with Pro Tools. And it's usually not Pro Tools fault, but it's very demanding on mm. your your system. So make sure you check out that episode. Uh, you'll find the link in the description down below. Yeah, we also have a written compendium on ProToolsAnswers.com under articles, and you it's pinned to the top of our Facebook page as well. So it should be nice and easy to find, uh, written and a video version too. I have one further question for for you guys, the limit number of real-time threads, is this something that's kind of akin to, in the older versions of Pro Tools, we had the, where you could dedicate numbers of pro, uh, processors? 
Um, I kind of similar. Yeah, it is. It it's is in the similar. same realm, right? It's mm. it's so so when you were so back in the day, and this is this is pre Pro Tools eleven, right? Mm -hmm. Where you pre could Pro choose Tools the 10, no. even. I think it's Pro it, yeah, Tools yeah. nine. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, is where you could basically choose how many of your computer's cores it could use because yes. of the hyper threading. Mm -hmm. um, there was there was an issue there. Um, what we found out uh, was that if you chose half of the cores that you had for some tasks you actually got better performance than if you chose all of your uh, course but those those days are long long gone now that we're down up to a 64-bit application we don't have to do that anymore but yeah i would say that's a safe bet to say that that's a um they're in the same realm of of system optimization i i bring it up because there are still people that are going to be using earlier versions you know i'm aware sure. of i'm aware of studios that are still running versions of uh, pro tools 7 on tiger because it's just super solid and stable you know, yep. and it's just studio computer. No reason to change it. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, we, uh, we, we were in Tokyo and we. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, Andy. No, we were we were in Tokyo. We were playing around with with all sorts of things in the playback engine. We we're just stress testing, stress testing, stress testing. Mm -hmm. We're like, I wonder what would happen if it doesn't hyper thread at all. And we chose half the cores, which, you know, so so for a multi core, so if, if you choose half of those or less right mm. all of a sudden we got less errors for certain kinds of things for, for edit density and stuff like that and like oh there you go so a, a little bit of a, of a counterintuitive result um but yeah but that was back in the day so if you're still running uh an old system and if you've got stability problems try uh changing your number of cores to half or less of your available yeah. List. yeah, another trick uh, that used uh, you could experiment with this, of course, is some versions that I had, which was around Pro Tools 7 uh, and 8, was that you take the maximum amount of cores and you just mm -hmm. do one less. So if you had uh, core, eight cores, you, you set them to seven instead. And that's actually the, if you don't click the limit number of real-time threads, it's actually using the amount of real-time threads that you have and uh, minus one. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the setting mm -hmm. that you have if you don't click this. But, uh, and if you find yourself that you need to, to make this setting, there's probably something else wrong with your system. Uh, so you should see both of these limit number of real-time threads and ignore errors during playback and record as your last resort. You mm -hmm. need, if you need to run your session and you don't have the time to make sure that all of your plugins are up to date and everything mm -hmm. else that's suggested. This is the way that you can power through this uh, session that you need to, to yeah. get done today without having to call in sick or something. But, uh, but so it's, it's, yeah, but it, it's like, but, but it's a long, it's not a long time solution for you. Uh, no, it's it's like fixing a yeah. wound with super glue, isn't it? You c it's literally exactly. just to get you through the day. You don't want to be bouncing down with that on. Yeah. Okay, great, uh, great stuff there. Uh, let's talk about the dynamic plugin processing. Uh, Andy, do you want me to do it, or should I? Uh, should, should you, or me, or, or or Dave? Do you want to do Dave, it? Dave, go for it. I can talk about. It. So I I love this this little theory because I don't understand why this this even has a checkbox on it. And Andy's going to remind us why in a little bit. But dynamic plugin processing is very very smart because basically, and unless a piece of audio is running through a plugin, Pro Tools will just uh, dis, uh, disinclude it from, uh, uh, from resources. So it'll only activate plugins when Pro Tools detects audio flowing through the plugin. Y yes, yes um, almost. <laughs> I, I think there's a couple asterisks mm -hmm. there. It doesn't activate and deactivate a plugin, but the plugin is in a low consumption mode when there's no audio being processed. Yes, I didn't mean um, it would physically bypass it or deactivate right. it. Yep. That's not what it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> it, it it stays in 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 a in a in a conserved mode mm. until there's work for it to do, and then it will then consume CPU resources based yeah. upon the work that it has to do. And when that work is not le needed anymore, then then the CPU gauge will go back down, mm -hmm. which is great. I mean, it's so fantastic. Um, you know, that that addition to Pro Tools on its own. Um, you know, breathed new life into old, otherwise struggling systems, mm -hmm. right? And, and you could just do so much more with, with your system now that you're, you're dynamically allocating CPU. So the question, of course, comes up. It's like, 
well, why would you ever not check that box? Mm-hmm. And I didn't know the answer. So I went to you know <laughs> colleagues, and many of my colleagues didn't know the answer. I'm like, well, why? <laughs> um, come to find out that um, it's mostly a diagnostic thing. So mm-hmm. if you uncheck that box, what will happen is that your CPU gauge will will go up to the very maximum that it could ever possibly use. In other words, if there was audio on all your tracks at the same time, this would be how much it would use. And so if, you know, if you're doing a real-time bounce, or maybe, Anders, if you're doing something like a, a live performance and you need to make sure that your, your system can handle the, the most of the most, mm. then turning that off is going to give you a good sense of can your system play it? So if you, if you're, you know, if you're looking at your your uh, CPU usage and it's down at ten percent, you know, as you're playing, and then all of a sudden in one section you've got, you know, one hundred and thirty two tracks that are all playing a sound, and then it peaks up to one hundred and ten percent. Well, then you've got problems. But if you uncheck that box, then all of your tracks, all of your plugins will go active. Mm-hmm. Um, it, they they won't dynamically allocate their their consumption of resources, and you'll see the maximum amount that your system could consume. Mm-hmm. And that was just about the best answer for unchecking that box that I got. Now, if you're doing, if you're mixing inside the box, obviously it's not a big deal. If you're bouncing internally, zero problem. Um, so I would say it is again, you know, know what it does, um, and then if you ever need to kind of do a spot check of how much your system is using, yeah, uncheck that box, and then you'll see how much of that system it it could possibly use in a worst case worst case scenario. Yeah, that's great information. I I, I love that explanation, Andy. <laughs> that's great stuff. Uh, so what what kind of plugins don't switch off? Uh, so because there are some that that will not power off or or, or go down in, mm-hmm. in this power consumption mode. What what might cause a problem to uh, or, or cause a plug plugin to not do that? If it's creating harmonic content. It, like if you have a, 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 a guitar amplifier that has a noise built into it, mm-hmm. it's creating that content, or maybe you have a plugin that that is creating this noise as part of of the signal processor. Like if, for mm. for some waves plugins that like like a compressor yeah. that has a built-in noise that's supposed to be there because the original unit was noisy mm. and that's part of the flavor. So that noise creates a signal all of the time which do, mm. which and 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 even if you're not playing audio through it that noise will still be there mm. and that will cause this pro- uh, plugin to not go into low power consumption mode so it will not power off that's so great yes. I, ne- I never thought it in, about it in that way I, I was expecting the answer to be something like guitar sims or or uh, midi instruments but i never considered the fact that where you've got that constant like tape machines you know yeah. that, that constant low level noise that's a feature of it i never considered that they would be disincluded sure i would I, i'm not Brilliant. sure if i would say any you know, plugins that have harmonic content because you know there's a lot of amps that will will add harmonic content to a guitar but mm. don't have that um, kind of the the noise floor that mm. emulates an, another mm. kind of amp, but you're 100 percent right. If there's if there's an ever present signal in a plugin, then then Pro Tools is smart enough to know that that's needed the whole time, mm-hmm. right? And it won't, you know, because there's a signal on the on the output of that plugin, it will know then, you know, don't ever shut that off, yeah. right? But otherwise, you know, if, if it, basically the Pro Tools looks at all the plugins individually, and once their output level is goes below minus 144 dB, yeah. then then the plugin is now a candidate for for being shut off, mm. or, or sorry, going into a low consumption. Mode. So that that actually opens up a slightly different uh, a bit of extra information that if you are someone who is constantly editing out all of your silence that's going to guarantee that there's no audio going through the plugin and dynamic processing is going to work properly. If you've got a vocal track, for example, where you've got just a little bit of noise floor that continues all the way through, um, the plugin may not shut off. And if you if you're like I used to be, and you you like nice pretty tracks, so you do a lot of consolidate. Mm-hmm. So so I'll, I'll have like one vocal line, but because I like nice pretty. Yeah. Clips, I'll, I'll, I, you know, be like one line in the middle of a three-minute song, and then 
you know, two minutes and 30 seconds of, of silence on either end. Mm -hmm. if, if it's processing silent audio, it's still processing. Yeah, yeah. And it's probably and, not, and it's that, not going to be dead silent, is it? There's going to be some kind of noise floor in there. Oh, it's, it's, it's dead silence. You, you <clears throat> can have dead, dead silence. You can consolidate dead silence. Okay. And, and it will still, if the plugin sees that clip, it has to do work. Pro Tools knows that it has to do work mm -hmm. and it'll draw the CPU resources as soon as it sees that clip. So, so you know, consolidating in the interests of, of making things look neat and tidy is not working in your favor when it comes to dynamic plugin processing. Uh, okay, great. That I never thought about that, but that's, <laughs> that's a, a great thing. So about, what about the next function here? Optimize performance at low buffer sizes. We talked about this in the previous episode, right? Mm -hmm. should, we, should we do a, a quickie? Uh, um, uh, do a very brief, one? You know, do a brief reminder, then we'll jump over to disk cache. Okay, so um, the optimized performance at low buffer sizes is basically uh, reducing the time it takes for Pro Tools to wake up uh, 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 certain functions in your CPU uh, when it's in lower buffer sizes. And it's basically only the two uh, lowest, sorry, click the wrong one, the two lowest buffer sizes available to you that, uh, that are affected by this uh, setting and if you want to know, know more about this feature you should check out the previous episode which was episode number 24 24 yeah. exactly thank you D a deeper dive into 2021.6 mm -hmm. yeah uh, uh who's there's, who? there's one more before yeah. the uh before disc playback cache mm -hmm. and anders can't show it but i can oh of course yes i don't see that either <laughs> so i'll oh. stop sharing I guess. Oh. Escape, I need to press, sorry. This will be something that's valid as long as there are Intel Macs. <clears throat> that's right. So for how much longer that may be. With with the way with the way I keep computers, another thirty seven years. <laughs> <laughs> I keep computers until they burst into flames. Um, so, so yeah, so the Intel Turbo Boost is, is something that uh, you will only see with Intel Macs. Um, improves performance, but may cause Mac fan noise. Uh, I, have, I have been the recipient of that strange sensation of being at an airport. Um, yes, it, 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 will, it will bring that fan online and, and your, your computer may get a little bit warmer than it normally does. Um, but otherwise, it, it's... You know, it's not uh, not the end of the world to keep it on. Uh, if you want to keep your uh, your computer quiet, if you're recording and the computer's in the room, yeah, you might want to uncheck that box. But other than that, uh, Intel Turbo Boost uh, is is going to give you more power um, when you when you're working. It's basically just overclocking, um, so that allows you to do that. And we all want power, right? And we all want power. Mm -hmm. Some say some say we're obsessed with it, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, are we ready for the disk playback cache? We are, and as take us home. Oh, um, am I doing that? Maybe I should load up a, uh, another session. By the way, quickly. Uh, you know, disk playback cache works differently than it used to. Oh, then it you should do does, it. It does not take up um, all the, all the um, room immediately. It's an upward limit. Oh, I didn't know that. It's just Thank changed. You. It just changed. Just changed. So let me let me double check and make sure that I'm not lying to you. Um, I'm I'm loading up another session just uh, yeah, go ahead. To, to have uh, load, load up a session that has a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, exactly. But it basically, if you set, for example, if you set it to the maximum, and you have no audio, it doesn't take up any room. Okay, great. Yeah, which is awesome. Uh, do, 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 do. Sorry for taking... How are you doing on time, Dave? Yeah, we're good. We've got 40, uh, 30 minutes or so before I need to zoom. Uh, uh, just searching for a session here. Ah, that one will be okay, I think. Okay. We 
need to edit this out, Dave. No, I thought I might keep this in. This is gold. No, this is, this you you is don't riveting. you don't get this quality on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get this quality on Soundflower. Actually, when I started sharing now, it didn't open my video window back no, up. No, that 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 doesn't stick. So 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 mm. that sticks. So not mm. opening up the window. By the way, you know your little floaty thing is not mm. visible to us, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. but it's visible in my video stream that's recorded on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Oh, on, on Camtasia, true. sorry. On yeah. Camtasia, yes. Yeah. So you can see I'm opening up a session here. It takes a little bit of time because there's actual audio in it. And it's got flugelhorn, by the way. You, flugel flugelhorn. 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 How do you call that in, uh, in English? Flugelhorn. Yes. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, Flugelhorn. of course I know what you mean. Yeah. Your English Flugelhorn. is perfect. It is it's so good. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, okay. Uh, let me explain that. I'll just make sure that Disk Playback Engine is... Um, or, sorry, Disk Playback Cache is set to normal first. Mm -hmm. And then I'll start explaining. Okay, so this is a session. Uh, it's mixed uh, instrument tracks with a couple of audio uh, stuff, uh, actual recordings of, of violins and, and singing and guitars and stuff like that. So it's a bit of a mixed um, thingy. And what Pro Tools will do is it will stream all of this audio from my hard drive. As I press play, it will start extracting that data in real time from the hard drive, which of course, uh, it puts a little bit of demand on my hard drive. Uh, a faster hard drive will be able to stream more tracks, of course. And if you have a slower one or a lot of tracks, you might eventually run into uh, a bit of, of trouble here. So when I press play, it fairly quickly starts playing it. And it's, uh, it's not a problem with this session, which is only about 46 tracks of audio. But um, in the playback engine, we have something called the disk playback cache, which is now set to normal. So what happens then is as soon as I click anywhere in the session, Pro Tools will start preparing to play from this part. And it, it usually buffers around half a second of audio directly closest to my, my, uh, my playback um, cursor here. So it basically starts buffering so that when I press play, it can start playing faster than it if, would, if it would need to stream everything off of the hard drive. So it speeds up the process a little. But uh, I also have the possibility in the playback engine here to set a disk playback cache. And what that is, is that Pro Tools um, am I doing something wrong here, Andy? I hear you. Sorry, if you could um, show the system usage window while you're making these changes. Ooh. Okay, great. I'll go to uh, to window system usage here. And this is the actual system usage of my system right now. We can see that Pro Tools is taking up 14% of my system memory for the, the playback engine and everything that's running uh, on the system. Uh, so this guy here is really really important and if i and press notice play, if, if, if you hold if, if you move your mm -hmm. cursor to that yellow bar um mm -hmm. at, at memory and, and hover for just a second you can see in the memory there you go and you hover there it'll tell you of that 14 percent audio is using seven percent of your um of your computer's available mm -hmm. memory and video is using the other seven percent mm -hmm. keep okay. that figure in mind Great, so now I go to set the playback engine and I'll go to set the disk cache size now to a very small amount. So I'll set 256 megabytes and this reserves 256 me megabytes of my RAM memory for audio. And what we will see is that Pro Tools will get a new meter right around here in the activity and it will display this new uh, uh, playback cache. So as soon as I hit OK here, we can see the disk cache and it starts filling up 
and as you as as you can see now it's using seven uh, 19 percent of the disk playback cache uh, and as we can see here the timeline is 49 megabytes so it's not that much it's a 30 second jingle for for some kind of commercial um, so so it's basically streaming all of the audio directly from the hard drive uh, maybe i should have selected something that with a lot of, <laughs> of audio here because yeah, we can't really bigger sessions so in this session, which is slightly bigger, we will see that, um, sorry, just let me set this. Like so. So in this session, which is slightly larger, we can see that the disk cache filled up to 100%, and it's showing that the timeline is 832 megabytes. So in order to cache the entire timeline into the disk cache, I need to set the playback cache to at least one gigabyte. So I'll go into setup, playback engine, go to the cache size of one gigabyte and hit OK. And we will now see that Pro Tools will um, make changes here and it will set up a line to where he will fill up. And as soon as he's cached all of the files, the disk cache meter turns green, which means that the entire timeline is now stored in RAM memory and will not be streamed off of the hard drive. So when I press play, it will stream directly from the RAM memory, which will cause a Pro Tools to start and stop extremely fast. And I will have basically no delay. So when I press start, it will instantly play back from, from RAM. And the advantage of course is that I can have a very slow hard drive, whereas yeah. I have, I have a NAS drive in the room behind me and I can still use that. It usually should be too, too slow for this big session, but using the disk cache will allow me to have a slower drive. Yes, but it's, there's, there's a compromise, right? Yeah. Because more stuff in RAM, more audio to be played back from RAM means less available RAM for plugins and other processes. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I think people do kind of reflexively is they set their playback cache um, you know, to the, to the highest level and they think somehow they're getting a stronger system in terms of plugins and then mm -hmm. they're surprised when, when there's no RAM left over because you know, they've got you know, hundreds of tracks of audio and it's all playing back from RAM, and there's very little RAM left for, for anything else. Um, it was This feature was originally conceived for folks that are working off of networked systems, right? So that not everybody is streaming all the time from, from, a, from a central server, right? I would say that for me, um, I, live, I live in the world of the normal disk playback cache. Um, mm -hmm. in, in my room here, um, I... I can, you know, a fraction of a second to start and stop playback is not an, a hardship for me. But if I was to to know that I was not using my system's RAM to give me enough plugins, that would be an issue. So normal is my normal state in, in Pro Tools. But if I wanted to, for example, if I was playing for a, a live system and I wanted something that was additionally stable, um, copying it to RAM, which is very fast and, 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 and reliable and, and streaming it from RAM, that's just another way to get your system to be more responsive and, and in a sense, when you're, when you're playing back like that, for more stable as well. Yeah, and of course, I mean, there is no best way here. It's totally depending right. on your type of work that you do and what kind of, how many tracks you're using and how much RAM you have in your in your system. If you have a lot of RAM, you can easily set this to be three gigabytes and you will not okay. notice any uh, anything. Uh, there might be ad other limiting factors. But if you are uh, uh, using a computer with very limited amount of RAM, maybe you are on 16 gigs or even worse, 8 gigs or something, you mm -hmm. can't afford to reserve 3 or 4 or 5 gigs for That's for, right. for this, so you should stick to normal. Yeah. Uh, I got 64 gigabytes in my computer and I'm running almost all of my sessions from my NAS drive, so I usually set this to 3 gigabytes and I just forget about the setting. I, I, I run that. But, but uh, you should do what your system uh, uh, allows you to do. And uh, yeah. 
So, yeah. so remember, all of these things in, in the playback engine can be turned and on and turned off for a reason, right? So, and, and if we can teach you anything on the show, it's that it's, it's how to make the choices, not that there's one or one right or wrong choice, not telling you what to do or what not to do, but tell you when to do one thing and when not to do the other. Yeah, and it's also something that you need to think dynamically about. I'm changing your settings in in your session mm -hmm. uh, from time to another is okay. Uh, you might start off yeah. with a very low hardware buffer size and set that to a higher buffer size at some point and reduce it again. And you, yeah. you can change these settings as you go. And it's very important to understand how they work so you can more make the informed decisions yeah. about how to use it's the functions. Perfectly exactly normal right. to be jumping in and out of hardware buff uh, the, uh, the playback engine window. Yeah. Do it all the time. Um, it's interesting that Andy brought up that the disk cache was conceived because of network drives. I found disk playback, uh, the, the disk cache to be a game changer for people who are working at higher sample rates using slower hard drives and slower hard drive connections, USB 2 specifically. Because mm. if you know, you're trying to run a session at 88.2 or 96, it just, the, the system just can't stream it quick enough. You know, especially if you're running off USB 2 um, and USB in general, maybe, depending on how many devices you have on your USB bus. But especially if you're running a 5200 RPM drive. The, when we switched over to SSD drive, suddenly the, the need for the dish cast become a lot less, I found. Because, you know, Certainly. You've, yeah. you've got that lovely instant... Uh, it, kind of instant pull, um, loads of bandwidth for, from an internal hard drive, but you're if you're still using USB 2 or USB buses with loads and loads of stuff on, being able to reserve a few gigabytes for the for, for, for audio streaming can in significantly improve your quality of life. Indeed. That's true. <laughs> uh, so that's all the functions in the playback engine. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, do you want to wrap this up? I do. What, what should people <laughs> do if they like the the <laughs> today's episode? Well, let me tell you. So, if you're enjoying what we were doing uh, today, you can hit like on the video. Um, if you're liking what we're doing with Pro Tools Answers, you can hit subscribe. Uh, if you like learning about this kind of stuff, we also have ProToolsAnswers.com where you can head, head over there and subscribe as well. And if you really like what we're doing and you want to support us and, uh, and our efforts here, uh, you can head over to Patreon.com forward slash ProToolsAnswers where you may be able to toss us a few bucks every so often, uh, which just helps us run the channel uh, in the way that hopefully you would like it to be run and definitely in the way that we would like it to be run, right? Because we don't want to be slave to the corporations, right, Andy? Exactly right. We are here for you. <laughs> so all these Am I just... still sharing my screen? That's... You are, yes. Sorry. You're like the anti-Dave. <laughs> <laughs> you I share the screen you. when you don't need to. <laughs> you share <laughs> shares too much. So all it needs me to say is thank you so much to Anders. Thank you. Thank you very much to Andy. You bet. My name's Dave. This is Pro Tools Answers, and we're out. <laughs>